This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. That's L-I-B-R-I-V-O-X dot org. Today's reading by Miette of Miette's Bedtime Story Podcast. Ulysses by James Joyce. Chapter 12 I was just passing the time of day with old Troy of the DMP at the corner of Arbor Hill there, and be damned but a bloody sweep came along, and he nearly drove his gear into my eye. I turned around to let him have the weight of my tongue, when who should I see dodging along stony butter? Only Joe Hines. "'Lo, Joe,' says I, "'how are you blowing? "'Did you see that bloody chimney-sweep "'near shove my eye out with his brush?' "'Soot's luck,' says Joe. "'Who's the old ballocks you were talking to?' "'Old Troy,' says I, "'was in the farce. "'I'm on two minds not to give that fellow in charge "'for obstructing the thoroughfare "'with his brooms and ladders.' "'What are you doing round these parts?' says Joe. "'Devil a much,' says I. "'There's a bloody big foxy thief beyond by the garrison church at the corner of Chicken Lane. "'Old Troy was just giving me a wrinkle about him. "'Lifted any god's quantity of tea and sugar to pay three bob a week. "'Said he had a farm in the county down off a hop of my thumb by the name of Moses Hetzog over there near Hylesbury Street.' "'Circumcised?' says Joe. Aye, says I, a bit off the top. An old plumber named Garrity. I'm hanging on to his towel now for the past fortnight, and I can't get a penny out of him. That the lay you're on now, says Joe. Aye, says I. How are the mighty fallen, collector of bad and doubtful debts? But— that's the most notorious bloody robber you'd meet in a day's walk, and the face on him all pockmarks would hold a shower of rain. Tell him, says he, I dare him, says he, and I double dare him to send you round here again, or if he does, says he, I'll have him summonsed up before the court, so I will, for trading without a license. And after he's stuffing himself till he's fit to burst. Jesus, I had to laugh at the little Jewy getting his shirt out. He drinks me my teas, he eat me my sugars, because he pay me my monies. Because he no pay me my monies. For non-perishable goods bought out of Moats' Herzog of 13 St. Kevin's Parade in the city of Dublin, Wood Quayward, merchant, herein after called the vendor, and sold and delivered to Michael E. Geraghty, Esquire of twenty nine Arbor Hill in the city of Dublin, Aran Quayward, gentleman, herein after called the purchaser, videli set five pounds avoir du poin of first choice tea at three shillings and no pence per pound avoir du poin, and three stone avoir du poin of sugar. Crushed crystal at three pence per pound avoir du poids. The said purchaser, debtor to the said vendor of one pound five shillings and six pence sterling for value received, which amount shall be paid by said purchase to said vendor in weekly instalments every seven calendar days of three shillings and no pence sterling. And the said non-perishable goods shall not be pawned or pledged or sold or otherwise alienated by the said purchaser, but shall be and remain and be held to be the sole and exclusive property of the said vendor to be disposed of at his good will and pleasure until the said amount shall have been duly paid by the said purchaser to the said vendor in the manner herein set forth as this day hereby agreed between the said vendor his heirs successors trustees and assigns of the one part and the said purchaser his heirs successor trustees and assigns of the other part are you a strict t t says joe not taking anything between drinks says i 
"'What about paying our respects to our friend?' says Joe. "'Who?' says I. "'Sure, he's out in John of God's off his head, poor man.' "'Drinking his own stuff?' says Joe. "'Aye,' says I. "'Whiskey and water on the bread.' "'Come round to Barney Keenan's, says Joe. "'I want to see the citizen.' Barney Mavel needs be it, says I. Anything strange or wonderful, Joe? Not a word, says Joe. I was up at that meeting in the city arms. What was that, Joe? says I. Cattle traders, says Joe, about the foot and mouth disease. I want to give the citizen the hard word about it. So we went around by Linenor Barracks, and the back of the courthouse, talking of one thing or another. Decent fellow, Joe, when he has a, when he has it, but sure like that he never has it. Jesus, I couldn't get over that bloody foxy Garrity, the daylight robber. For trading without a license, says he. In Innisfail, the fair there, lies a land. The land of holy Mishan. There rises a watch tower beheld of man afar. There sleep the mighty dead as in life they slept, warriors and princes of high renown. A pleasant land it is in sooth of murmuring waters, fishful streams where the sport, the gurnard, the plays, the roach, the halibut, the gibbed haddock, the grills. The dab, the brill, the flounder, the pollock, the mixed coarse fish, generally, and other denizens of the aqueous kingdom too numerous to be enumerated. In the mild breezes of the west and of the east, the lofty trees wave in different directions their first class foliage the wafty sycamore, the Lebanonian cedar, the exalted plane tree the eugenic eucalyptus, and other ornaments of the arboreal world, which that region is thoroughly well supplied. Lovely maidens sit in close proximity to the roots of the lowly, lovely trees, singing the most lovely songs, where they play all kinds of lovely objects, as, for example, golden ingots, silvery fishes, crumbs of herrings, draughts of eels, codlings, creels of fingerlings, purple sea-gems, and playful insects. And heroes voyage from afar to woo them, from Ebelana to Sleeve Margie, the peerless princess of unfettered Munster, and of Connacht, the just and of smooth, sleek, Leinster, and of Cruan's land, and of Armagh the splendid, and of the noble district of Boyle, princes, the sons of kings. And there rises a shining palace, a shining palace, whose crystal glittering roof is seen by mariners who traverse the extensive sea in barks built expressly for that purpose, and thither come all herds and fatlings and Fistfuls of that land for O'Connell Fitzsimmon takes toll of them, a chieftain descended from chieftains. Thither the extremely large wains bring foison of the fields, flaskets of cauliflowers, floats of spinach, pineapple chunks, rangoon beans, strikes of tomatoes, drums of figs, trills of swedes, sulfurical potatoes, and tallies of iridescent kale, york and savoy, and trays of onions, pearls of the earth, and punnets of mushrooms, and custard marrows, and fat vetches, and beer, and rape, and red, green, yellow, brown, russet, sweet, big, bitter, ripe, pomelated apples, and chips of strawberries and Caesar gooseberries, poppy and pelurious, and strawberries fit for princes, and raspberries from their canes. Mm. I dare him, says he, and I double dare him. Come out here, Garrity, you notorious bloody hill and dale robber. And by 
that way wend the herds innumerable of bellwethers and flushed ewes and shearling rams and lambs and stubble geese and medium steers and roaring mares and polled calves and long woods and stall sheep and coofs prime springers and culls and sow pigs and bacon hogs and the various different varieties of highly distinguished swine and angle angus heifers and pully bullocks of immaculate pedigree together with prime premiated milk cows and beeves and there has ever heard a trampling cackling roaring lowing bleating bellowing rumbling grunting champing chewing of sheep and pigs and heavy hoofed kind from pasture lands of lusk and rush and carrick mines and from the steamy vales of thormund from the mcgiddies reeks the inaccessible and lordly shannon the unfathomable and from the gentle declivities of the place of the race of keir their udders distended with superabundance of milk and butts of butter and rennets of cheese and farmers firkins and targets of lamb and crannocks of corn and oblong eggs in great hundreds various in size the agate with this done so we turned into barney kiernan's and there sure enough was the citizen up in the corner having a great confab with himself and that bloody mangy mongrel gary owen and he waiting for what the sky would drop in the way of drink there he is says i in his glory hole with his crucine lawn and his load of papers working for the cause the bloody mongrel let a grass out of him would give you the creeps be a corporal work of mercy if someone would take the life of that bloody dog. I'm told for a fact he ate a good part of the breeches off a constabulary man in Sutry that came round one time with a blue paper about a license. Stand and deliver, says he. That's all right, citizen, says Joe. Friends here. Pass, friends, says he. Then he rubs his hand in his eye and says he... What's your opinion of the times? Doing the rappery and the roary of the hill, but, be gob, Joe was equal to the occasion. I think the markets are on a rise, says he, sliding his hand down his fork. So, be gob, the citizen claps his paw on his knee, and he says, Foreign wars is the cause of it. And says Joe, sticking his thumb in his pocket, it's the Russians wish to tyrannize. Ah, rah, give over your bloody coddling, Joe, says I. I have a thirst in me that wouldn't sell for half a crown. Give it a name, citizen, says Joe. Wine of the country, says he. What's yours, says Joe. Ditto Macnasby, says I. Three pints, Terry, says Joe. And how's the old heart, citizen, says he. Never better, Echara, says he. What, Gary, are we going to win, eh? And with that he took the bloody old towser by the scruff of the neck, and by Jesus he near throttled him. The figure seated on a large boulder at the foot of a round tower was that of a broad-shouldered, deep-chested, strong-limbed, frank-eyed, red-haired, freely freckled, shaggy-bearded, wide-mouthed, large-nosed, long-headed, deep-voiced, bare-kneed, brawny-handed, hairy-legged, ruddy-faced, sinewy-armed hero. From shoulder to shoulder he measured several L's, and his rook-like mountainous knees were covered, as was likewise the rest of his body wherever visible, with a strong growth of tawny prickly hair in hue, and toughness similar to the mountain gorse, Ulex Europius. The wide-winged nostrils, from which bristles of the same tawny hue projected, were of such capaciousness that within their cavernous obscurity the field lark might easily have lodged her nest the eyes in which a tear and a smile strove ever for the mastery were of the dimensions of a good-sized cauliflower 
a powerful current of warm breath issued at regular intervals from the profound cavity of his mouth while in rhythmic resonance the loud strong hail reverberations of his formidable heart thundered rumblingly causing the ground the summit of the lofty tower and the still loftier walls of the cave to vibrate and tremble he wore a long unsleeved garment of recently flayed ox-hide reaching to the knees in a loose kilt and this was bound about his middle by a girdle of plaited straw and rushes beneath this he wore trews of deer-skin roughly stitched with gut his nether extremities were encased in high balbriggan buskins dyed in lichen purple the feet being shod with brogues of salted cowhide laced with the windpipe of the same beast from his girdle hung a row of sea stones which jangled at every movement of his portentous frame and on these were graven with rude yet striking art the tribal images of many irish heroes and heroines of antiquity Cuchulin, con of hundred battles nial of nine hostages brian of kinkora the Ardry Malachi, Art McMurray, Shane O'Neill, Father John Murphy, Owen Rowe, Patrick Sarsfield, Red Hugh O'Donnell, Red Jim McDermott, Suggeth Owen O'Groney, Michael Dwyer, Francie Higgins, Henry Joy McCracken, Goliath, Horace Wheatley, Thomas Conniff, Peg Woofington, the village blacksmith, Captain Moonlight, Captain Boycott, Dante Alighieri, Christopher Columbus, S. Fiercer, S. Brendan, Marshall McCowan, Charlemagne, Theobald Wolfe Tone, the mother of the Maccabees, the last of the Mohicans, the Rose of Castile, the man for Galway, the man that broke the bank at Monte Carlo, the man in the gap, the woman who didn't, Benjamin Franklin, Napoleon Bonaparte, John L. Sullivan, Cleopatra, Savoon in Delish, Julius Caesar, Paraclesis, Sir Thomas Lipton, William Tell, Michelangelo Hayes, Muhammad, the Bride of Lammermoor, Peter the Hermit, Peter the Packer, Dark Rosaline, Patrick Lam uh, Patrick W. Shakespeare, Brian Confucius, Myrtle Gutenberg, Patricio Velasquez, Captain Nemo, Tristan and Isolde, the First Prince of Wales, Thomas Cook and Son, the Bold Soldier Boy, Arana Pogue, Dick Lurpin, Ludwig Beethoven, the Colleen Bourne, Wada Healy, Angus the Cooldy, Dolly Mount, Sidney Parade, Ben Houth, Valentine Greetrix, Adam and Eve, Arthur Wellesley, Boss Crocker, Herodotus, Jack the Giant Killer, Gotama Buddha, Lady Godiva, the Lily of Killarney, Balor of the Evil Eye, the Queen of Sheba, Aki Nagel, Joe Nagel, Alessandra Volta, Jeremiah O'Donovan Rusa, Don Philip, Don Philip O'Sullivan Beer, a couched spear of a Cuminated granite rested by him while at his feet reposed a savage animal of the canine tribe whose steatoris gasps announced that he was sunk in uneasy slumber a supposition confirmed by the hoarse growls and spasmodic movements which his master repressed from time to time by tranquillizing blows of a mighty cudgel rudely fashioned out of paleolithic stone so anyhow Terry brought the three pints. Joe was standing and begobbed. The sight nearly left my eyes when I saw him land out a quid. Oh, as true as I'm telling you. A good-looking sovereign. And there's more where that came from, says he. Were well, you robbing the poor box, Joe? says I. Sweat to my brow, says Joe. Twas the prudent member gave me the wheeze. I saw him before I met you, says I, sloping around by Pill Lane and Greek Street with his cod's eye, counting up all the guts of the fish. Who comes through Mission's land, bed light and sable armour? Oh, Bloom, the son of Rory, it is he. Impervious to fear is Rory's son, he of the prudent soul. For the old woman of Prince's Street, says the citizen, the subsidised organ. The pledge-bound party on the floor of the house. And look at this blasted rag, says it. 
Look at this, says he, the Irish Independent, if you please, founded by Parnell to be the working man's friend. Listen to the births and deaths in the Irish for all Ireland Independent, and I'll thank you and the marriages. And he starts reading them out. <clears throat> Gordon, Barnfield Crescent, Exector, Redman of Ifley, St. Anne's on Sea, the wife of William T. Redman of a son. How's that, eh? Wright and Flint, Vincent and Gillette to Rutha Marion, daughter of Rosa and the late George Alfred Gillette, 179, Chapham Road, Stockwell, Playwood and Risdale, at St. Jude's, Kensington, by way of the very reverend Dr. Forrest, Dean of Worcester, eh? Deaths. Bristow at Whitehall Lane, London. Carr stroke Newington of gastritis and heart disease. Cookburn at the Moat House. Chepstow. I know that fellow, says Joe, from bitter experience. Cookburn. Dimsey, wife of David Dimsey, late of the Admiralty. Jesus. Miller Tottenham, age eighty five, Welsh, June twelfth, at thirty five Cunning Street. Liverpool, Isabella Helen. How's that for a national press, eh, my brown son? How's that for Martin Murphy, the Bantry jobber? Ah, well, says Joe, handing round the booze. Thanks be to God they had the start of us. Drink that, citizen. Health, Joe, says I, and all down the farm. Ah, ow, don't be talking. I was blue mouldy for the want of that pint. Declare to God I could hear it hit the pit of my stomach with a click. And lo, as they quaffed their cup of joy, a godlike messenger came swiftly in, radiant as the eye of heaven, a comely youth, and behind him there passed an elder of noble gait and countenance, bearing the sacred scrolls of law, and with him his lady, wife, a dame of peerless lineage, fairest of her race. Little Alf Bergen, popped in round the door, and hid behind Barney's snug, squeezed up with a laughing. And who was sitting up there in the corner that I hadn't seen snoring drunk, blind to the world? Only Bob Dorin. I didn't know what was up, and Alf kept making signs out of the door. And begob, what was it only that bloody old pantaloon Dennis Breen in his bath slippers, with two bloody big books tucked under his oxter, and the wife hot foot after him? Unfortunate, wretched woman, trotting like a poodle. I thought Alf would spit. Look at him, says he. Breen, he's traipsing all round Dublin with a postcard someone sent him with U.P. Up on it to take a lit, and he doubled up. Take a what? says I. Libel action, says he, for ten thousand pounds. Oh, hell, says I. The bloody mongrel began to growl. That had put the fear of God in you, seeing something was up. But the citizen gave him a kick in the ribs. Be I do hushed, says he. Who? says Joe. Breen, says Alf. He was in John Henry Menton's, and then he went round to Collins and Ward's, and then Tom Rookford met him and sent him round to the sub sheriffs for a lark. Oh, God, I've a pain laughing. You pee. The long fellow gave him an eye as good as a process, and now the bloody old lunatic has gone round to Green Street to look for a G-man. When is Long John going to hang that fellow in Mount Joy? says Joe. Bergen, says Bob Doran, waking up. Is that Alf Bergen? Yes, says Alf. Hanging? Wait till I show you. Here, Terry, give us a pony, that bloody old fool, ten thousand pounds. You should have 
seen Long John's eye. You P. And he started laughing. Who are you laughing at? says Bob Durin. Is that Bergen? Hurry up, Terry boy, says Alf. Terence O'Ryan heard him and straightway brought him a crystal cup full of the foamy Eben ale, which the noble twin brothers Bonnevay and Bunganan brew ever in their divine alvats, cunning as the sons of deathless leader. For the garner, the succulent berries of the hop and moss, and sift and bruise and brew them, and they mix therewith sour juices, and bring the must to the sacred fire, and cease not night or day from their toil, those cunning brothers, lords of the vat. Then did you, chivalrous Terence, hand forth as to the manner born, and you offered the crystal cup to him that thirsted, the soul of chivalry, in beauty akin to the immortals. But he, the young chief of the O'Bergans, could ill brook to be outdone in generous deeds, but gave therefore with gracious gesture a testune of costliest bronze. Thereon embossed in excellent smithwork was seen the image of a queen of regal port, scion of the house of Brunswick, Victoria her name. Her most excellent majesty, by grace of God of the United Kingdom of Great Britain and Ireland, and of the British dominions beyond the sea, queen, defender of the faith, empress of India, even she, who bore rule, a victress over many peoples, the well-beloved, for they knew and loved her from the rising of the sun to the going down thereof, the pale, the dark, the ruddy, and the Ethiop. "'What's that bloody Freemason doing?' says the citizen, prowling up and down outside. "'What's that?' said Joe. "'Here you are,' says Alf, chucking at the rhino. Talking about hanging, I'll show you something you never saw. Hang men's letters. Look at here. So he took a bundle of wisps of letters and envelopes out of his pocket. Are you codding? says I. Honest Injun, says Alf. Read them. So Joe took up the letters. Who are you laughing at? says Bob Doran. So I saw there was going to be a bit of a dust. Bob's a queer chap when the porter's up in him. So says I, just to make talk. How's Willie Murray these times, Alf? I don't know, says Alf. I saw him just now in Capel Street with Paddy Dingham. Only I was running after that. You what? says Joe, throwing down the letters. With who? With Dingham, says Alf. Is it Puddy? says Joe. Yes, says Alf. Why? Don't you know he's dead? says Joe. Potty Dingham, dead? says Alf. Aye, says Joe. Sure, I'm seeing him not five minutes ago, says Alf, as plain as a pike stuff. Who's dead? says Bob Durin. You saw his ghost then, says Joe. God between us and harm. What? says Alf. Good Christ, only five. What? And Willie Mary with him, the two of them there near. Who do you call him? What? Dingham dead. What about Dingham? says Bob Durin. Who's talking about? Dead, says Alf. He's no more dead than you are. Maybe so, says Joe. They took the liberty of burying him this morning anyhow. Paddy, says Alf. Aye, says Joe. He paid the debt of nature. God be merciful to him. Good Christ, says Alf. Be gob, he was what you might call flabbergasted. In the darkness, spirit hands were felt to flutter, and when prayer by tantras had been directed to the proper quarter, a faint but increasing luminosity of ruby light became gradually visible, the apparition of the etheric double being particularly lifelike, owing to the discharge of jivic rays from the crown of the head and face. 
Communication was effected through the pituitary body, and also by means of the orange fiery and scarlet rays emanating from the sacral region and solar plexus. Questioned by his earth name as to his whereabouts and the heavenward, he stated that he was now on the path of P R I Y A or return, but was still submitted to trial at the hands of certain bloodthirsty entities on the lower astral levels. In reply to a question as to his first sensations in the general divide but beyond, he stated that previously he had seen an as in a glass darkly, but that those who had passed over had summit possibilities of atmic development opened up to them. Interrogated as to whether life there resembled our experiences in the flesh, he stated that he had heard from the more favoured beings now in the spirit that their abodes were equipped with every modern home comfort, such as Talafana, Alvatar, Hatakeda, Wata Closet, and the highest adepts were steeped in waves of volupsy of the purest nature. Having requested a quart of buttermilk, this was brought and evidently afforded relief. Asked if he had any message for the living, he exhorted all who were still at the wrong side of Maya to acknowledge the true path, for it was reported in divanic circles that Mars and Jupiter were out for mischief on the early eastern angle where the ram has power. It was then queried whether there was any special desires on the part of the defunct, and the reply was, We greet you, friends of Earth, who are still in the body. Mind C.K. doesn't pile it on. It was ascertained that the reference was to Mr. Cornelius Kelleher, manager of Mrs. Mrs. H. J. O'Neill's popular funeral establishment, a personal friend of the defunct who had been responsible for the carrying out of the internment arrangements. Before departing, he requested that it should be told to his dear son Patsy that the other boot which he had been looking for was at present under the commode in the return room, and the pair should be sent to Cullen's to be sold only as the heels were still good. He stated that this had greatly perturbed his peace of mind in the other region, and earnestly requested that his desire should be made known. Assurances were given that the matter would be attended to, and it was intimated that this had given satisfaction. He is gone from mortal haunts. O Dingham, son of our morning, fleet was his foot on the bracken. Patrick of the beamy brow, whale, Banba, with your wind, and whale, O ocean, with your whirlwind. There he is again, says the citizen, staring out. Who, says I? Bloom, says he. He's on point of duty up and down there for the last ten minutes. And begob, I saw his fizzog do a peep in and then slitter off again. Little Alf was knocked backwards. Faith he was. Good Christ, says he. I could have sworn it was him. And says Bob Durin, with the hat on the back of his pole, lowest blackguard in Dublin when he's under the influence. <coughs> Who said Christ is good? I beg your parsnips, says Alf. Is that a good Christ, says Bob Durin, to take away the poor little Willie Dingham? Ah, well, says Alf, trying to pass it off. He's over all his troubles. But Bob Doran shouts out of him. He's a bloody ruffian, I say, to take away poor little Willie Dingham. Terry came down and tipped him the wick to keep quiet, that they didn't want that kind of talk in a respectable licensed premises. And Bob Doran starts doing the weeps about Paddy Dingham. True as you're there. The finest man, he says, snivelling, the finest, purest character. The tear is bloody near your eye. 
talking through his bloody hat, fitter for him to go to the little sleep-walking bitch he married, Mooney, the bumba bailiff's daughter. Mother kept a kip in Hardwick Street. That used to be stravaging about the landings, Bantam Lyons told me that he was stopping there at two in the morning without a stitch on her. Exposing her person, open to all corners, fair field, and no favour. The noblest, the truest, says he, and he's gone, poor little Willie, poor little Paddy Dingham. And mournful, and with a heavy heart, he bewept the extinction of that beam of heaven. Old Gary Owen started growling again at Bloom that was skeezing round the door. Come in, come on, he won't eat you, said the citizen. So Bloom slopes in with his cod's eye on the dog, and he asks Terry, was Martin Cunningham there? Oh, Christ, McGowan, says Joe, reading one of the letters. Listen to this, will you? And he starts reading out one. 7 Hunter Street, Liverpool. To the High Sheriff of Dublin. Dublin. Honoured Sir, I beg to offer my services in the above-mentioned painful case I hanged Jogan in Bootle Jail on the 12th of February, 1900, and I hanged... Show us, Joe, says I. Private Arthur Chase for foul murder of Jesse Tilsit in Pentonville Prison, and I was assistant when... Jesus, says I. Billington executed the awful murderer, Toad Smith. The citizen made a grab at the letter. Hold hard, says Joe. I have a special knack of putting the noose. Once in, he can't get out. Hoping to be favoured, I remain. Honoured sir, my terms is five guineas. Hitch rumbled. Master Barber. And a barbarous bloody barbarian he is, too, says the citizen. And the dirty scrawl of the wretch, says Joe. Here, says he, take them to hell out of my sight. Off, hello, Bloom, says he. What will you have? So they started arguing about the point. Bloom saying he wouldn't and he couldn't and excuse him no offence and all to that. And then he said, well... He'd just take a cigar. Gorby's a prudent member, and no mistake. Give us one of your prime stinkers, Terry, says Joe. And Alf was telling us there was one chap sent in a morning card with a black border round it. They're all barbers, says he, from the black country that would hang their own fathers for five quid down and travelling expenses. "'And he was telling us there's two fellows waiting below to pull his heels down "'when he gets the drop and choke him properly, "'and then they chop up the rope after and sell the bits for a few bob a skull. "'In the dark land they bide, the vengeful knights of the razor. "'Their deadly coil they grasp, yeah, and therein they lead to Erebus whatsoever. "'White hath done a deed of blood, for I will on no wise suffer it, even so saith the Lord.' "'So they started talking about capital punishment, "'and of course Bloom comes out with the why and the wherefore "'and all the codology of the business, "'and the old dog smelling him all the time. "'I'm told those Jewies doors have a sort of queer odour "'coming off them for dogs, "'about I don't know what all that deterrent effect "'and so forth and so on. "'There's one thing it hasn't had a deterrent effect on,' says Alf. "'What's that?' said Joe. <laughs> "'Poor bugger's tool that's being hanged,' says Alf. "'That's so,' says Joe. "'God's truth,' says Alf. "'I heard that from the head warder that was in Kilmaine "'when they hanged Joe Brady, the Invincible. "'He told me when they cut him down after the drop "'it was standing up in their faces like a poker.' Ruling passion strong in death, says Joe, as someone said. 
that could be explained by science says bloom it's only a natural phenomenon don't you see because on account of the and then he starts with his jawbreakers about phenomenon and science and this phenomenon and the other phenomenon the distinguished scientist herr professor lutpolt blumenduft tendered medical evidence to the effect that the instantaneous fracture of the cervical vertebrae and consequent season of the spinal cord would according to the best approved tradition of medical science be calculated to inevitably produce in the human subject a violent ganglionic stimulus of the nerve centres of the genital apparatus thereby causing the elastic pores of the copra cavernosa to rapidly dilate in such a way as to instantaneously facilitate the flow of blood to that part of the human anatomy known as the penis or male organ resulting in the phenomenon which has been denominated by the faculty a morbid upwards and outwards philoprogenitive erection in articulo multis per diminuinem captis so of course the citizen was only waiting for the wink of the word and he starts gassing out of him about the invincibles and the old guard and the men of sixty-seven and who fears to speak of ninety-eight and joe with him all the fellows that were hanged drawn and transported for the cause by drumhead court-martial and a new ireland and new this that and the other talking about new ireland he ought to go and get a new dog so he ought Mangy, mangy, ravenous brute sniffing and sneezing all round the place and scratching his scabs. And round he goes to Bob Durin that was standing out for half one sucking up for what he could get. So of course Bob Durin starts doing the bloody fool with him. Give us the poor, give us the poor doggy, good old doggy, give that poor here, give us the poor. Ah, ah, bloody end to the poor, he'd poor, and now for trying to keep him from tumbling off the bloody stool of the bloody old dog, and he's taking all kinds of drivel about training by kindness and thoroughbred dog and intelligent dog. Give you the bloody pip. Then he starts scraping a few bits of old biscuit out of the bottom of a Jacob's tin he told Terry to bring. Gob, he galloped it down like old boots and his tongue hanging out of him a yard long for ma near ate the tin in all hungry bloody mongrel and the citizen in bloom having an argument about the point the brothers shears and wolf tone beyond on arbor street and robert em robert emmett and die for your country and tommy moore touch about sarah curran and she's far from the land and Bloom, of course, with his knock-me-down cigar, putting on swank with his lardy face. Phenomenon! The fat heap he married is a nice old phenomenon, with a back on her like a ballalley. Time they were stopping up in the city arms pisser, Burke told me there was an old one there with a cracked luderman of a nephew, and Bloom trying to get the soft side of her doing the mully cuddle playing by Zeke to come in for a bit of the wampum in her will and not eating meat of a Friday because the old one was always dumping her crawl and taking the lout out for a walk. And one time he led him round the rounds of Dublin and by the holy farmer he never cried crack till he brought him home as drunk as a boiled owl and said he did it to teach him the evils of alcohol and by herrings if the three women didn't near roast him it's a queer story the old one bloom's wife and mrs o'dowd that kept the hotel jesus i had to laugh at pisser burke taking them off chewing the fat and bloom with his but don't you see and but on the other hand and sure must be taken the lout i'm told was in powers afar the blenders round in cope street going home footless in a cab five times in the week after drinking his way through all the samples in the bloody establishment phenomenon the memory of the dead says the citizen, taking up his pint glass and glaring at Bloom. Aye, aye, says Joe. You don't grasp my point, says Bloom. What I mean is, 
Sin Fein, says the citizen, Sin Fein am hain. The friends we love are by our side, and the foes we hate before us. The last farewell was affecting in the extreme. From the belfries, far and near, the funereal deathbed, death bell toiled unceasingly, while all around the gloomy precincts rolled the ominous warning of a hundred muffled drums, punctuated by the hollow booming of pieces of ordnance. The deafening clasps of thunder and the dazzling flashes of lightning which lit up the ghastly scene testified that the artillery of heaven had lent its supernatural pop to the already gruesome spectacle. A torrential rain poured down from the floodgates of the angry heavens upon the bared heads of the assembled multitude, which numbered at the lowest computation five hundred thousand persons. A posse of Dublin Metropolitan Police, superintended by the Chief Commissioner in person, maintained order in the vast throng from for whom the York Street Brass and Reed Band whiled away the intervening time by admirably rendering on their black-draped instruments the matchless melody endeared to us from the cradle by Speranza's plaintive muse. Special quick excursions, trains and upholstered charablancas had been provided for the comfort of our country cousins, of whom there were large contingents. Considerable amusement was caused by the favourite Dublin street singers, El Hen, L N H N and M L L G N, who sang, the night before Larry was stretched, in their usual mirth-provoking fashion. Our two inimitable drolls did a roaring trade with their broadsheets among lovers of the comedy element, and nobody who has a corner in his heart for real Irish fun without vulgarity will grudge them their hard-earned pennies. The children of the male and female foundling hospital, who thronged the windows overlooking the scene, were delighted with this unexpected addition to the day's entertainment, and a word of praise is due to the little sisters of the poor, for their excellent idea of affording the poor fatherless and motherless children a genuinely instructive treat. The viceregal house-party, which included many well-known ladies, was chaperoned by their excellencies to the most favourable positions on the grandstand, while the picturesque, picturesque foreign delegation known as the Friends of the Emerald Isle was accommodated on a tribune directly opposite. The delegation, present in full force, consisted of Commentadore Bakabachi Beninobeninim, the semi-paralysed doyen of the party, who had to be assisted to a seat by the aid of a powerful steam crane. Monsieur Pierre Poul, Petit Paton, the grand joker Vladimir Pokethanischeff, the art joker Leopold Rudolf von Schwarzenbard Hoddenthaler, Countess Maha, Viraja Kisazoni Peter Pesci, Hiram Y. Bombust, Count Athanatos Karamapoulos, Ali Baba Bakshish, Rahat Locum Effendi, Senor Hidalgo Calballero Don Pacadillo y Palibras y Paternoster de la Mallorca de la Malaria, Hoko Poco Harakiri, He Hung Chang, Olaf Cobadettelessen, Mein Heer Trick von Trumps, Pan Poliax Paddy Risky, Goosepond Prixler Karabashesha, Boris Hupenov, Herr Hurhaus Director President, Hans Schulens Storelli, National Gymnasium Museum Sanatorium and Suspendorium Sordinary Private Docent General History Special Professor Dr. Creekfield Uniban Gemein. All of the delegates, without exception, expressed themselves in the strongest possible heterogeneous terms concerning the nameless barbarity which they all had been called upon to witness. An animated altercation in which all took part ensued among the FOTEI as to whether the 8th or 9th of March was the correct date of birth of Ireland's patron saint. 
In the course of argument, cannon balls, scimitars, boomerangs, blunderbusses, stink pots, met meat choppers, umbrellas, catapults, knuckle dusters, sandbags, lumps of pig iron were resorted to, and blows were freely exchanged. The baby policeman, Constable McFadden, summoned by special courier from Booterstown, quickly restored order, and with lightning promptitude proposed the seventeenth of the month as a solution equally honourable for both contending parties. The ready-witted nine-footer's suggestion at once appealed to all and was unanimously accepted. Constable McFadden was heartily congratulated by all the FOTEI, several of whom were bleeding profusely. Commentatore Benino Benoni, having been extricated from underneath the presidential armchair, it was explained by his legal adviser, Avocato Pagamini, that the various articles secreted in his thirty-two pockets had been abstracted by him during the affray from the pockets of his junior colleagues, in the hope of bringing them to their senses. The objects, which included several hundred ladies' and gentlemen's gold and silver watches, were promptly restored to their rightful owners, and generally harmony reigned supreme. Quietly, unassumingly, Rumbold stepped onto the scaffold in faultless morning dress, and wearing his favourite flower, the gladiolus cruentus, he announced his presence by that gentle Rambolian cough, which so many have tried, unsuccessfully, to imitate. Short, painstaking, yet withal so characteristic of the man. The arrival of the world-renowned headsman was greeted by a roar of acclamation from the huge concourse, the viceregal ladies waving their handkerchiefs in their excitement, while the even more excitable foreign delegates cheered vociferously in a medley of cries, Hook! Bonsai! Elgin! Zivio! Chin-Chin! Polychronia! Hip-Hip! Viva! Allah! Amid which the ringing Aviva of the delegate of the Land of Song, a high double F recalling these piercingly lovely notes, with which the eunuch Catalani beglamoured our great-great-grandmothers, was easily distinguishable. It was exactly seventeen o'clock. The signal for prayer was then promptly given by megaphone, and in an instant all heads were bowed. The commentadores patriarchal sombrero, which has been in the possession of his family since the revolution of Rienzi, being removed by his medical adviser in attendance, Dr. Pippi, the learned prelate who administered the last comforts of holy religion to the hero martyr when about to pay the death penalty knelt in a most christian spirit in a pool of rain-water his cassock above his hoary head and offered up to the throne of grace fervent prayers of supplication hand by the block stood the grim figure of the executioner his visage being concealed in a tangalon pot with two circular perforated apertures through which his eyes glowered furiously. As he awaited the fatal signal, he tested the edge of his horrible weapon by honing it upon his brawny forearm, or decapitated in rapid succession a flock of sheep which had been provided by the admirers of the fell but necessary office. On a handsome mahogany table near him were neatly arranged the quartering knife, the various finely tempered disembowelling appliances, specially supplied by the world-famous firm of cutlers, Messrs. John Round and Sons, Sheffield. A terracotta saucepan for the reception of the duodenum, colon, blind intestine and appendix, etc., once successfully extracted, and two commodious milk jugs, destined to receive the most precious blood of the most precious victim. The house steward of the amalgamated cats and dogs home was in attendance to convey these vessels when replenished to that beneficent institution. Quite an excellent repast consisting of rashers and eggs, fried steak and onions, done to a nicety 
delicious hot breakfast rolls and invigorating tea had been considerately provided by the authorities for the consumption of the central figure of the tragedy who was in capital spirits when prepared for death and evinced the keenest interest in the proceedings from beginning to end but he with an abnegation rare in our times rose nobly to the occasion and expressed the dying wish immediately acceded to that the meal should be divided in aliquot parts among the members of the sick and indulgent room-keepers association as a token of his regard and esteem the n e c and non plus ultra of emotion were reached when the blushing bride-elect burst her way through the serried ranks of the bystanders and flung herself upon the muscular bosom of him who was about to be launched into eternity for her sake the hero folded her willowy form in a loving embrace murmuring fondly sheila my own encouraged by this use of her christian name she kissed passionately all the various suitable areas of his person which the decencies of prison garb permitted her ardour to reach she swore to him as they mingled the salt streams of their tears that she would ever cherish his memory that she would never forget her hero boy who went to his death with a song on his lips as if he were but going to a hurling match in clontic park she brought back to his recollection the happy days of blissful childhood together on the banks of Annaliffy when they had indulged in the innocent pastimes of youth and oblivious of the dreadful present they both laughed heartily all the spectators including the venerable pastor joining in the general merriment that monster audience simply rocked with delight but anon they were overcome with grief and clasped their hands for the last time a fresh torrent of tears burst from the lac lacrimal ducks and the vast concourse of people touched to the inmost core broke into heart rendering sobs not the least affected being the aged prebendary himself big strong men officers of the peace and genial giants of the royal irish constabulary were making frank use of the handkerchiefs and it is safe to say that there was not a dry eye in that record assemblage a most romantic incident occurred when a handsome young Oxford graduate, noted for his chivalry towards the fair sex, stepped forward and, presenting his visiting card, bank book, and genealogical tree, solicited the hand of the hapless young lady, requesting her to name the day, and was accepted on the spot. Every lady in the audience was presented with a tasteful souvenir of the occasion, in the shape of a skull and crossbones brooch, a timely and general generous act which evoked a fresh outburst of emotion and when the gallant young oxonian the bearer by the way of one of the most time-honoured names in albion's history placed on the finger of his blushing fiancee an expensive engagement ring with emeralds set in the form of a four-leafed shamrock the excitement knew no bounds nay even the stern provost marshal lieutenant colonel tompkin maxwell french mullen tomlinson who presided on the sad occasion he who had blown a considerable number of sepoys from the cannon mouth without flinching could not now restrain his natural emotion with his mailed gauntlet he brushed away a furtive tear and was overheard by those privileged burghers who happened to be in his immediate entourage to murmur himself in a faltering undertone. God blimey if she ain't a clinker. There, that bleeding tart. Blimey, it makes me kind of bleeding cry straight it does when I sees her, cause I thinks of me old mustub what's waiting for me down Limehouse way. So then, the citizen begins talking about the Irish language in the corporation meeting, and all to that and the shoonies that can't speak their own language, and Joe chipping in because he stuck someone for a quid, and Bloom putting his old goo with his two-penny stump that he carged off of Joe, and talking about the Gaelic League, and the anti-treating League, and drink the curse of Ireland. Anti-treating is about the size of it. 
gob. He that you pour out all manner of drink down his throat till the Lord would call him before you'd ever see the froth of his pint. And one night I went in with a fellow into one of their musical evenings, song and dance about she could get up on a truss of hair, she could my morin lay, and there was a fellow with a bally hooly blue ribbon barge spiffing out of him in Irish, and a lot of Colleen brows going on with temperance beverages and selling medals and oranges and lemonade and a few old dry buns, gob, flagulag entertainment, don't be talking. Ireland sober is Ireland free. And then an old fellow starts blowing into his bagpipes, and all the gougers shuffling their feet to the tune of the old cow died of. And one or two sky pilots having an eye around that there was no goings on with the females, hitting below the belt. So how and ever, as I was saying, the old dog seeing the tin was empty starts mousing around by Joe and me. I'd train him by kindness, so I would if he was my dog. Give him a rousing fine kick now and again where it wouldn't blind him. Afraid he'll bite you, says the citizen, jeering. No, says I, but he might take my leg for a lamp post. So he calls the old dog over. What's on you, Gary? says he. Then he starts hauling and mauling and talking to him in Irish, and the old towser growling, letting on to answer, like a duet in the opera. Such growling you never heard as they left off between them. Someone that has nothing better to do than to write a letter pro bono publico to the papers about the muzzling order for a dog the like of that growling and grousing, and his eye all bloodshot from their druses in it, and the hydrophobia dropping out of his jaws. All those who are interested in the spread of human culture among the lower animals, and their name is Legion, should make a point of not missing the really marvellous exhibition of cyanthropy given by the famous old Irish red setter Wolf Dog, formerly known by the sobriquet of Gary Owen, and recently rechristened by his large circle of friends and acquaintances, Owen Gary. The exhibition which is the result of years of training by kindness and a carefully thought-out dietary system, comprises, among other achievements, the recitation of verse. Our greatest living phonetic expert, wild horses shall not drag it from us, has left no stone unturned in his efforts to delucidate and compare the verse recited, and has found it bears a striking resemblance the italics are ours, to the rands of ancient Celtic bards. We are not speaking so much of those delightful love songs with which the writer, who conceals his identity under the graceful pseudonym of the little sweet branch, has familiarized the book-loving world, but rather, as a contributor, D.O.C. points out in an interesting communication published by an evening contemporary, of the harsher and more personal note which is found in the satirical effusions of the famous Rafferty and of Donald McConsign, to say nothing of a more modern lyrist at present very much in the public eye. We subjoin a specimen which has been rendered into English by an eminent scholar whose name for the moment we are not at liberty to disclose, though we believe that our readers will find the topical allusion rather more than an indication. The metrical system of the canine original, which recalls the intricate, alliterative, and isosybolic rules of the Welsh englim, is infinitely more complicated, but we believe our readers will agree that the spirit has been well caught. Perhaps it should be added that the effect is greatly increased if Owen's verse be spoken somewhat slowly and indistinctly in a tone suggestive of suppressed rancour. <clears throat> the curse of my curses, seven days every day, and seven dry Thursdays on you, Barney Keenan, has no sup of water to cool my courage, and my gut red roaring after Lowry's lights. So he told Terry to bring some water for the dog, and gob, you could hear him laughing it, lapping it up a mile off. And Joe asked him, would he have another? I will, says he, a charer to show there's no ill feeling. Go. 
orb. He's not as green as he's cabbage-looking. Arsing around from one pub to another, leaving it to your own honour, with old Giltrap's dog, and getting fed up by the ratepayers and corporators. Entertainment for man and beast. And says Joe, Could you make another hole in another pint? Could a swim duck, says I. Same again, Terry, says Joe. Are you sure you won't have anything in the way of liquid refreshment, says he. Thank you, no, says Bloom. As a matter of fact, I just wanted to meet Martin Cunningham. Don't you see about this insurance of poor Dingham's? Martin asked me to go to the house. You see, Dingham, I mean, didn't serve any notice of the assignment on the company at the time, and nominally, under the act of the mortgages, can't recover on the policy. Holy wars, says Joe, laughing. That's a good one if old Shylock is landed. So the wife comes out top dog, what? Well, that's a point, says Bloom, for the wife's admirers. Whose admirers, says Joe? The wife's advisers, I mean, says Bloom. Then he starts all confused, mucking it up about mortgager under the arch like the Lord Chancellor, giving it out on the bench and for the benefit of the wife, and that a trust is created, but on the other hand that Dingham owed Bridgman the money, and if now the wife or the widow contested the mortgage's right till he near had the head of me addled with his mortgager under the arch. He was bloody safe. He wasn't running himself until that time. As a rogue and vagabond, only he had a friend in court. Selling bazaar tickets to what you call it Royal Hungarian Privileged Lottery. True as you're there. Oh, commend me to an Israelite Royal and Privileged Hungarian Robbery. So... Bob Dorin comes lurching around asking Bloom to tell Mrs. Dingham he was sorry for her trouble, and he was very sorry about the funeral, and to tell her he said, and everyone who knew him said, that there was never a truer, finer person than poor little Willie that's dead to tell her. Choking with bloody foolery, and shaking Bloom's hand doing the tragic to tell her that. Shake hands, brother, you're a rogue, and I'm another. Let me, said he, so far presume upon our acquaintance, which, however slight it may appear, if judged by the standard of mere time, is founded, as I hope and believe, on a sentiment of mutual esteem, as to request of you this favour. But, should I have overstepped the limits of reserve, let the sincerity of my feelings be the excuse for my boldness. No, rejoined the other, I appreciate to the full the motives which actuate your conduct. And I shall discharge the office you entrust to me, consoled by the reflection that, though the errand be one of sorrow, this proof of your confidence sweetens in me some measures of the bitterness of the cup. Then suffer me to take your hand, said he. The goodness of your heart, I feel sure, will dictate to you better than my inadequate word the expressions which are most suitable to convey an emotion whose poignancy, were I to give vent to my feelings, would deprive me even of speech. And off with him, and out trying to walk straight. Boost at five o'clock. Night he was near being lagged, only Paddy Leonard knew the bobby, fourteen a blind to the world, up in a shebeen in Bride Street after closing time, fornicating with two shawls and a bully on guard, drinking porter out of teacups, and calling himself a Frenchie for the shawls, Joseph Manuo, and talking against the Catholic religion, and he serving mass in Adam and Eve's when he was young with his eyes shut, who wore the New Testament, and the Old Testament, and hugging, and smugging and the two shawls killed with a laughing, picking his pockets, the bloody fool, and he spilled the porter all over his bed, and the two shawls screeching, laughing at one another. How is your testament? Have you got an old testament? Old Paddy was passing there, I tell you what. Then see him of a Sunday with his little concubine of a wife, and she wagging her tail up the aisle of the channels with her patient boots on her no less and her violets, nice as pie, doing the little lady. 
Jack Mooney's sister, and the old prostitute of a mother procuring rooms to street couples. Gob! Jack made him toe the line. Told him if he didn't patch up the pot, Jesus, he'd kick the shite out of him. So, Terry brought the three pints. 